Good afternoon. Here's our headlines this hour. Following Hamas's surprise attack against Israel on Saturday, the death toll on both sides has surpassed 1,500. Hamas claims to have 100 or more hostages that it could execute without warning if Israel continues bombing Gaza. Israel in return said Hamas will pay a heavy price and that Israeli troops may soon prepare a ground incursion into Gaza. And South Korea's main chip makers, Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix, will be allowed to supply U.S. chip equipment to their factories in China without receiving separate approvals from Washington. South Korea's presidential office views the latest waiver as an extension of a stronger Seoul-Washington alliance. And this year's Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences has been awarded to American economic historian Claudia Golden. She's been recognized for her work on advancing the understanding of the workplace gender gap. And let's start with the Israel-Hamas conflict. More than 1,500 have been killed on both sides. Israel's prime minister has pledged to take ultimate revenge against Hamas. Che Suyong starts us off. Since Saturday's surprise attack in Israel by the Palestinian militant group Hamas, there have been over 1,500 deaths on both sides. Meanwhile, Israeli airstrikes on the Gaza Strip, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry, have led to more than 600 deaths. Hamas have also taken about 150 people hostage and is holding them in the Gaza Strip. Among the casualties and hostages, there are also citizens of the United States and the United Kingdom, France, Germany and Ukraine, among others. Following Hamas' attack on Saturday, the Security Cabinet of Israel has declared a total blockade of the Gaza Strip and announced a final retaliation. Dear Israeli citizens, we started, and I emphasize, we have only started to strike Hamas. Israel has announced the mobilization of up to 300,000 reserve forces, and U.S. officials expect that Israeli forces will begin a ground operation in the Gaza Strip within 48 hours. Hamas has threatened to execute civilian hostage in retaliation for Israeli airstrikes. A Hamas spokesperson stated that they will execute one civilian hostage for each attack by Israel and civilian homes in the Gaza Strip without prior warning. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres strongly condemned Hamas's attacks on Israel while expressing concern about Israel's total blockade of the Gaza Strip. Currently, the South Korean government is closely monitoring the situation in Israel and some of South Korea's long-term residents and travelers in Israel, totaling around 930 people, are expected to return home on direct flights by Korean Air on Wednesday Korea time. Cha Soo-hyung, Arirang News. The escalating situation in the Middle East has already shaken the global economy. Oil prices surged more than 4 percent following Saturday's attack. On Monday local time, prices of the U.S. benchmark Western Texas Intermediate and global benchmark Brent crude both gained more than 4 percent, with WTI settling at more than 86 U.S. dollars per barrel and Brent crude settling at more than 88 dollars per barrel. That's the biggest one-day jump for both since April 3rd and comes amid rising concerns of the violence escalating into a regional conflict that could disrupt output from oil producers in the Middle East. President Yoon sung yeol has expressed concern over the Israel-Hamas conflict turning into an all-out war and has called on the government to minimize the impact on Korean safety and livelihoods. Speaking at a cabinet meeting on Tuesday, the South Korean leader said the possibility of the situation escalating into an international conflict cannot be ruled out as Iran and the Hezbollah back the Hamas group while Western countries support Israel. Noting that previous conflicts in the Middle East led to a rise in global oil prices, Yoon warned this could lead to further economic instability, with inflation pushing up domestic interest rates. He called for measures to stabilize the cost of living and financial security and to ensure access to energy during the winter months. He also asked the foreign ministry lead efforts to ensure the safety of Korean residents and travelers as the conflict stretches on. Meanwhile, South Korea and the U.S. are continuing to strengthen their bilateral alliance. As part of efforts, Washington has decided to indefinitely suspend import restrictions for South Korean firms producing chips in China. This comes after months of Seoul's officials and businesses making their case to the U.S. Our top office correspondent Oh Soo-young reports. 
the United States has suspended restrictions indefinitely on South Korea's largest chip makers importing American semiconductor equipment to their factories in China as Huawei works to resolve its biggest bottlenecks in global trade. On Monday, Senior Presidential Secretary for Economic Affairs Choi Sang-mok said the U.S. government designated Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix's semiconductor plants in China as verified end-users. This allows the two firms to import sensitive tech items for use in their Chinese chip factories without the need to obtain a permit each time. This decision by the U.S. government means that the biggest trade issue for Korean chipmakers has been resolved. This has also greatly alleviated uncertainties related to their factory operations and investments in China. Last October, the U.S. imposed new rules to restrict advanced computing and chip production gear from entering China to curb the growth of Beijing's chip industry and its dealing of technology. Samsung and SK Hynix had a one-year exemption, but Seoul has for months been pushing for an extension of that grace period, which was set to expire this month. Semiconductors last year made up almost a fifth of South Korea's exports. More than 40% of Samsung's NAND chips and half of SK Hynix's DRAM chips are produced at plants in China. While noting that other trade issues may arise in the future, Yoon's economic aide said Washington's waiver came about as Presidents Yoon and Joe Biden since their first summit in May last year have committed to close cooperation on high-tech supply chains while strengthening their bilateral alliance. Chair also projected optimism on Korean auto giant's green car sales in the U.S. market, saying the Korean government has been helping them secure subsidies under Washington's Inflation Reduction Act, which sets out assembly and battery requirements that largely favor American firms with domestic manufacturing. Furthermore, amid various headwinds facing the Korean economy, Chess said the Yoon government boosted foreign direct investment to unprecedented levels, recording almost 24 billion US dollars from January to September, a rise of 11.3 percent on year. Greenfield investment in high tech industries like chips and batteries, he said, are likely to help strengthen supply chains and create new jobs across the domestic economy. Oh Seung, Arirang News. South Korea's 21st National Assembly has started its last annual parliamentary inspection of the government. For 24 days starting Tuesday, 17 standing committees of the assembly are inspecting over 790 government departments and agencies. The ruling and opposition parties are expected to clash during discussions on a series of controversial issues, such as the release of the Fukushima wastewater and allegations against Democratic Party Chairman Lee Jae-myung. The inspection comes six months before the general election set for next April. April. Moving on to North Korea, Pyongyang has touted its achievements to become what it called a world power as the ruling Workers' Party marked its 78th founding anniversary on Tuesday. The ruling party's official Dodongshimo newspaper reported that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un exceptionally strengthened combat power over the past decade and said the party would continue to win for the next thousands of millions of years. It also praised past leaders Kim Il-sung, who founded the party, and Kim Jong-il, who led it. The newspaper also noted the regime's recent constitutional amendment on the use of nuclear force, calling it yet another meaningful and important political achievement. Rescue workers have been ramping up search efforts to pull bodies and survivors from the rubble following Saturday's powerful earthquake in Afghanistan. An Songjin looks in detail. A 6.3 magnitude earthquake hit western Afghanistan with an epicenter in a rural area some 40 kilometers from the city of Herat on Saturday. The latest reports have put the death toll at almost 3,000 with thousands more injured. I lost four members of my family. Every house has several dead. I don't want to live anymore. I've lost my soul. I don't know what to do or what to say. Tens of thousands of people have been displaced as houses in villages and districts of Herat province were turned into rubble. Residents remained on alert until Monday when periodic aftershocks continued to shake the area. The head of the World Health Organization emergency response said that women and children make up two-thirds of those admitted to hospital. The earthquake happened in the morning where men were out of the houses, so majority of those who are injured and died are women and children, adding more pressure on women, more adding more pressure on children who are the most vulnerable groups inside Afghanistan. A UN humanitarian coordinator on Saturday approved a five million U.S. dollar emergency reserve allocation from the Afghanistan Humanitarian Fund.
We, along with our humanitarian partners, are now ramping up to the response. We've deployed assessment teams, and we are providing emergency shelter supplies, blankets, warm clothes, food. Local officials say the death toll is likely to rise as search and rescue efforts continue. Afghanistan is frequently hit by earthquakes, as seen in June last year when the eastern part of the country was hit by a 5.9 magnitude quake, which resulted in over 1,000 deaths. An Song Jin, Arirang News. This year's Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences has been awarded to Professor Claudia Golden. Golden's work uncovered key drivers behind the gender pay gap, making her just the third woman to receive the prize and the first to not share the award with male colleagues. Lee seung has more. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences announced Monday that it has awarded Harvard professor Claudia Golden the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for her work on women's employment and pay. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has decided to award Sveriges Riksbanks Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel 2023 to Professor Claudia Golden, Harvard U University, USA for having advanced our understanding of women's labor market outcomes. The 77-year-old lecturer in labor market history at Harvard University's work examined 200 years of data on the U.S. workforce, revealing how and why gender differences in earnings and employment rates changed over time. The Academy noted that her research has provided the first comprehensive account of women's earnings and labor market participation through the centuries, while showing the causes of change as well as the main sources of the remaining gender gap. Golden's research showed that married women started to work less after the arrival of industrialization of the 1800s, but their employment picked up again in the 1900s as the service economy grew. She noted that while higher educational levels for women and the contraceptive pill accelerated change, the gender wage gap remained. She also concluded that while earning differences between men and women could be blamed on educational and career choices made at a young age, the current earnings gap was now largely due to the impact of having children. Golden becomes just the third woman to receive the Nobel Economics Prize and the first to not share the honor with male colleagues. Lee seung Arirang News. BTS member Jungkook's latest single, 3D, featuring Jack Harlow, has debuted on the Billboard Hot 100 in the number five spot. The release is his second in the top five, following on from his previous single, Seven. According to Billboard, his latest single, which was released on the 29th of last month, debuted at number five on the latest chart, making him the first K-pop solo artist to have two successive singles to debut in the top five. Seven debuted at number one in July this year. Psy had singles Gangnam Style and Gentlemen enter the top five in the Billboard Hot 100 chart, but Gangnam Style did not debut in the top five. Over the weekend, locals and visitors from around the world can enjoy a large-scale fireworks display at Seoul's Yeoido Han River Park. Our reporter Ilni was at the 2023 Seoul International Fireworks Festival to capture it all. Huge crowds of people gathered beneath the autumn sky. Breathtaking fireworks fill the canvas of the night at the Han River Park in Yeoido. Around one million people came together for the 2023 Seoul International Fireworks Festival over the weekend, with South Korea's government pledging safety as a priority. The festival was organized by Hanwha Group, and according to company officials, this year's event was the biggest ever with over 400 LED firework firing drones taking part and a record number of barges, each reportedly loaded with hundreds or even thousands of fireworks positioned on the river. Officials say around 102,000 fireworks were used. The event was supposed to feature three teams under the theme Lights of Tomorrow. However, a technical issue meant Poland had to withdraw, leaving Korea and China to put on a show. Team Korea embroidered the autumn sky with beautiful fireworks, creating unforgettable memories for audience members from a variety of countries. Breathtaking fireworks lit up the night sky, coordinated with a wide range of music, including a creative display of letters and numbers. The Korean team performed a remarkable fireworks display that captivated onlookers, leaving them in awe.
As the stunning fireworks light up the night, you can feel a shared sense of wonder and amazement washing over the crowd. The Chinese team, named Sunny, also illuminated the night sky with beautiful fireworks, conveying messages under the theme, A Dream Comes True. With Chinese music on in the background, Team Sunny provided an experience that momentarily transported you to China. The colorful fireworks in the night sky were part of a spectacular performance, creating a memorable scene. It was really beautiful. Um, I didn't expect it to be like this kind of grand stage with so many people in the organization. I think it's very well organized um, for everyone just to move, keep moving, and everyone to be safe. So It's so beautiful that I wish we had more opportunities like this. A moment that goes beyond the fireworks above. It is a moment that unites us, captivates our hearts, and reminds us of the beauty in gazing up at the wonders of the world. Ian He, Arirang News. On the cultural front, the annual Busan International Film Festival is expected to wrap up this Friday. Our culture correspondent Song Yijin shows us what this year's edition still has to offer. It's not just star-studded red carpets and prestigious awards that define the Busan International Film Festival. Since it began in 1996, BIF has had a clear mission to promote Asian films to the world. This mission has gained more importance in recent years as Asian cinema, once overshadowed by Europe and Hollywood, has stepped into the limelight. Martin Derwan, founder and director of Europe's oldest Asian film festival, has witnessed this transformation firsthand. I've been going to the Cannes Film Festival for 25 years, and these days I feel incredibly proud to see Asian films making their mark, winning awards at Cannes. For Asian filmmakers and actors, BIF offers them a chance to showcase their creations to a global audience. Like the world premiering movie The Scavenger of Dreams, this film shows the lives of a family of waste collectors in India and touches on bureaucracy, discrimination and the wealth gap. There's a section of society we, um, not consciously, but we just uh, turn a blind eye. I just want, you know, honestly to portray their life. And I always believe, for me, filmmaking is an exercise in empathy. Another noteworthy debut, Doi Boy. Through the main character who is a massage therapist at a gay massage parlor, the film sheds light on pressing socio-political issues in Thailand, like ethnic minorities, undocumented immigrants and sex workers. As each Asian country has its unique cinematic color, more platforms like BIF are needed to showcase this rich diversity. The varied original voices coming out of India, coming out of Hong Kong, coming out of Taiwan, coming out of Korea, is um, mind-blowing. And, and it is a testament to the fact that, that, that you know, um, th there is an original lens that we have towards cinema that is, that is uh, uh, being appreciated by the world, the way we appreciated French New Wave, or German new wave, or Iranian new wave. Yeah, as an actor, or even for the film directors, we still need like more support. But I think it's getting better since we can connect to Asian uh, filmmakers or film festival, and uh, we have more like more platform to like to share our story. Something. Just like every other year, this year's BIF serves as a gateway for these stories to reach a wider audience. Song Yujin, Arirang News, Busan. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. The United Kingdom and Ireland are set to be announced as the official joint hosts of Euro 2028. The announcement is slated for Tuesday local time at a UEFA meeting in Switzerland. The UK and Ireland bid is now all but guaranteed after Turkey withdrew its competing submission last week after being approved to join Italy's 2032 bid instead. The move means both bids are unopposed but still need official UEFA approval. The 2028 tournament will be played in 10 stadiums across England, Scotland, the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland and Wales, with the latter three hosting a major football tournament for the first time. 
Staying in sports, the men's marathon world record was smashed over the weekend with a new time of 2 hours 35 seconds. The record-breaking run set on Sunday at the Chicago Marathon by Kenya's Kelvin Kiptum beats the previous best by more than 30 seconds. It was set in September last year by a fellow Kenyan, Iliud Kipchoge, at the Berlin Marathon. The 23-year-old said he had not originally planned to break the world record, but felt that he could do it toward the end of the run. The new world record comes after Kiptum broke the previous best time for the London Marathon in April. The Kenyan's compatriot Benson Kipruto came second, while Belgian Bashir Abdi finished third. And finally, eyes were firmly fixed on the sky as over 500 balloons lifted off from the U.S. state of New Mexico on Saturday as the nine-day Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta kicked off. Spectators watched as a variety of balloons, including ones shaped like animals and Star Wars characters, took to the air. The Fiesta's opening also saw the start of the Gordon Bennett gas balloon race, with teams still competing to get their balloons to travel the farthest distance across the U.S. The event got its start in 1972, with only 13 balloons taking part, while last year the event drew around 830,000 spectators. Matthew Ashley, Adirang News. Good afternoon. A chilly start has turned into a mild afternoon and it is a fine autumn day under blue skies. Temperatures are hovering around the season norms in most parts of the country. But temperature gaps can be 10 to 15 degrees. Those in inland areas are having wider temperature gaps. You know, October is a month of change and brings ups and downs in the weather. And such conditions can weaken your immune system, so take good care of yourself so as not to come down with a cold. Afternoon highs are similar to yesterday, hovering in the low 20s since Seoul and Chuncheon, Daejeon are topping out at 23 degrees Celsius under plenty of sunny skies in most parts of the country. Meanwhile, winds will get stronger in east coast regions with a chance of few spotty showers in east of Gangwon-do province. Nice weather this week. Sunshine will be out most of the week. Just beware of wider temperature differences and try to take full advantage of the weather before it gets too chilly. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. Before we end off, it's time for the Anchor's Pick, where I deliver my own snippet of insight on the top news this hour. Saturday's assault on Israel by Hamas happened almost exactly 50 years after the day the 1973 Yom Kippur War broke out. On October 6, 1973, on Yom Kippur, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar, Israel's neighbors, Egypt and Syria, supported by other Arab nations, launched a surprise attack. This October 7th, Hamas carried out a surprise attack that has left at least 900 dead in Israel, and Israel's retaliation has so far left around 700 dead in Gaza. It's not the first time fighting has broken out between these two, though. One previous instance in 2021 lasted 11 days and killed at least 250 people in Gaza and 13 in Israel. But the scale of attack and damage done is different this time around. The Hamas has kidnapped Israelis before, but it has never taken this many. The militant group on Monday said it would start killing hostages if Israeli airstrikes target people in Gaza without warning. Israel has pledged that Hamas will pay a heavy price. And for the rest of the week, I'll bring you more of my own picks of facts that you need to keep an eye on. Until then, that was our Nooncast on Arirang News.